So hello and welcome back, and uh, we're doing the 500 subscriber anniversary Q and A thing that I'm doing as the uh, whatever I'm doing as like a thank you for subscribing. So we kind of do these Q and A's at uh, random milestones. I think the last one I was going to try to do was going to be at like 100, and then it turned into being like 300 because it's <laughs> when I finally got around to doing one. And now we're doing 500, and next one is going to be a thousand. If that ever, if we ever get there, and I know what I'm gonna do. I already know I do what I'm doing for the thousand subscriber anniversary and five thousand. I've set the f one where I'm gonna cook and do a face cam video. That is going to be five thousand, unless I just get a bug up somewhere and I do it anyways. But anyways, thousand is gonna be probably a response video to someone if I can find someone who's bad at doing transportation. But anyways, we're gonna get into the five hundred because we have we got questions. So my first question is going to come from Henry Tift, who um, is asking me, well, there's three questions in this from him, and um, this is what it's going to be. It's, uh, what is my favorite electric locomotive? I have to say that I very much am a fan of the AEM-7, the, the Swedish meatball. It's a very basic design, but for whatever reason, I kind of like the more basic designs of the electric engines, rather, or even locomotives in general, uh, more so than the kind of modern siemens -y European looking ones. I know this is still also a European based design, but I don't know. Something about the this design to me seems I don't know, like it, it seems less like a car and more like a um train than like the um ACS sixty fours that are that it replaced it and the chargers that are gonna be replacing those in a couple years, or I guess more like ten years. So I it's, it's just I don't know. It it looks more like a train, it looks less like a car, and I kinda like that. So my favorite train station was the next question, and I really do like the Sacramento Valley Station, which is there's a reason why. Um, out of all the station highlights, it was the first one that I did. It's, I mean, they are renovating it. They have renovated it. It's, I know it's not like the big famous station that someone would probably expect someone like me, like a train nerd, to pick. But no, it's big it's a modest station it has it's getting Im improved it has um, like a little food court in it now they're trying to get more uh businesses and whatnot and make it like a focal point of the city um i don't like that they moved the tracks farther away and didn't move the station but you know can't have everything <laughs> but it's still a good station i've gone through it a lot i've used it a lot to travel so it very much has um kind of a spot in my heart and I very much uh, like it and um, so yeah we'll just move on from there and then the last one is what do I think of observation cars that are just like a glass wall at the end and like usually stuck in the middle of them so I'm going to be totally honest I'm not entirely sure what that means so I'm guessing it's like a car like this which is from the Seaboard Railroad which um, no idea when or if I will ever get to um, them as a railroad, but I'm guessing this is what, um, Henry's talking about and I'm hoping so. I kind of don't really have, um, an issue with these. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I've never really thought about it. Like, I get like how the rounded end observation car is kind of like the ones on the daylight and all the other major trains that ran in this country in the past are kind of like, I don't know, they have like an aura around them. I'm not really sure how else to put that. But I don't know, I don't really find these as being that big of an issue. Uh, or like the dome cars, because I mean, I know like because of Penn Station, they couldn't really have anything taller than this. But I don't know, I don't really see them as being that big of a problem. But uh, like I know there's also ones where they were meant to be like the end, but then they also had like the glass on the end where they did eventually stick them in the middle. That I kind of find weird because if something's supposed to be on the end of the train, why isn't it designed in a way that would make it so it, it's an end cap rather than a something that can be slotted in in the middle? So that I kind of find weird, but at the end of the, end of the day, I kind of don't find a car like this unusual or weird. It also could just be because... You know, we have the Superliners now, and uh, their observation cars are the, the the norm, at least for someone who grew up, um, well, he was not even 30 yet. So Jeffrey Osman also asked a question, and also thank you for being a longtime viewer. I think he was also one of my earlier subscribers. So he's asking me if I could sit down with the Amtrak powers that be for an afternoon over a meal. Uh, what questions would I ask, and what would I 
and would I not settle for any bullshit answers from them? Um, if I were to be sitting down with the powers that be, I would not be asking them questions. I would basically be trying to sell them on the um, my Amtrak 2035 revisited and like getting that through. Because, and by that I mean people in Congress. I don't, I mean Joe Biden's Joe Biden. <laughs> like he's not, um, how do I put that? He, be respectful, but to a person I don't particularly care for as, as a political person politician person uh he's basically not all there like he's not he's not anywhere near his like the top of his game so i wouldn't really care to talk to him about it like he obviously doesn't care about like his own agenda but yeah i would definitely try to convince congress that no doing something like i mentioned in the antrac 2035 uh response to my own video video um that no this is necessary and that's the minimum which is one of those things i kind of want to like respond to like some of the comments on that video I see that video as being what Amtrak should be as a minimum, not what you ask for to get basically slightly better crap. <laughs> so, and what I mean by that is I don't know what you would have to like in politician land ask for to get that, what I would want in that video and what I talked about, but I think that is the minimum. Like that is like the absolute bare minimum that Amtrak should have as an institution. And I would try to sell them on this and I would not accept that they're, um, bullshit on it like usually it'd be like oh it costs too much because honestly to give Amtrak like 132 billion dollars that's like three years of highway spending or like also three years of how much they increase the military budget every year and they never ask about like how are they going to pay for that and in all honesty rail improvements because you know, you know they, they attract economic development would actually just pay for itself over the course of its life so there's no real reason to worry about that so I wouldn't settle for that kind of bullshit, which is also, this is going to kind of lead us into the next question from D. Riley, is um, how can we convince automobile drivers that increasing pasture train ridership with a more robust rail network could actually decrease roadway congestion and make driving much less miserable for people who would still choose to drive their own cars? As someone who's talked to people who do like driving or just do drive in general, um, like the person I'm with, I have managed to convince him that building more highway infrastructure is useless considering um, induced demand is a thing. And this is a thing I'll be getting to in a later video and I actually talk about highways and induced demand and other forms of transportation and how those kind of work as a market. And basically just a tail ending. I think it might be one of the last videos in the urbanism series, but basically only way, I mean, the way you have to do with, at least with automobile drivers is one, if you convince them that, you know, economically having trains is better than cars or that there's economic benefits, usually they're fine with it. So long as you're not saying you should take highway funding away from the highways and redirect it somewhere else, usually they don't seem to care, you know, how robust the rail network is. The issue would be is convincing them to drive, uh, to take the train over driving. And it really depends. Like this is going to be one of those things where it kind of depends on where you live and what you're doing and the robustness of the rail network. Cause I mean, apparently my Amtrak standards having a train that runs four times a day is robust, but anyways, the way to convince them is basically to say that, look, this is an alternative. You don't have to deal with traffic. You can ride. And I think the best way that thing that Amtrak could do or Congress or a state or whatever would be to give like, when they open a new line, like give anybody along it who's willing to show up, say, hey, you get like a free 10 ride pass, like anywhere on the line. You know, if you just sh you show an ID saying you live in the town that it serves and you get a free 10 ride pass on the line and you get to use it over like the course of a year, I think something like that would probably do a lot to get people to like realize, oh, the train's actually worth taking, especially if they had more short distance services, like in the aforementioned Amtrak 2035 response to myself video or just expanding on myself. And uh, in the next part of the question is what benefits could a more robust passenger rail network bring to smaller and more rural communities, many of which across the U.S. sprung up as railroad towns anyways? So this is a thing um, I researched. I can't remember when and for why, but it was talking about the expansion of, oh, what is the line of Maine? The Down Easter and how... Just having the Down Easter running, I think it only runs like six round trips a day before COVID, that there's towns in like Massachusetts and Maine, not Massachusetts and Maine, New Hampshire and Maine, like along the coast that had, um, their downtowns were blighted. There was like no investment. No one really cared that their downtowns existed. Um, and after the train started running and the stations were rebuilt, some of the buildings around it, like old hotels and stores started being um, remodeled and reopened. 
So the main thing that w it would do is that having a rail station with, I think, train, I think according to APTA, you can only really need four round trips a day to start doing this, is um, the station basically kind of serves as a focal point. And since people will be moving in and out of it, it basically will just start pulling in economic activity. So you'll have the functioning train station. Um, it might get a couple hotels there, which will mean, you know, tourists and travelers and business people coming in, which means um, business will eventually, you know, grow around that to support them. And then that just kind of compounds outward. Now, this isn't to say that, you know, um, other issues in rural America, like having your industries ripped out and taken to like China um, or Mexico or just outsourced in general is basically what I'm getting at. Like having better rail service isn't going to solve that problem, <laughs> you know, depending on how the manufacturing of all this stuff goes. But um, basically is that it could basically serve as a magnet for economic development and economic activity, which will compound on itself over time. And all of this from like only having a, tr like a train running four round trips a day through your town. So, and that actually is like the way I think that you probably could sell this to like some of your more open-minded Republicans. Cause I know there's like Republicans like Dan Crenshaw in the world who will never vote for expanding Amtrak under any circumstance. But there are Republicans from some states that either have rail service still or have expanded rail service who might be a little bit more open to the whole, by the way, if you have trains running, you actually start um, turning these train stations into economic um, magnets. And these magnets will have enough economic um, well, economic activity and tax revenue to actually offset the cost of running the trains, which is actually one of the th things that um, I was reading the report on the North Coast Limited restoration the, um, I think it was Montana is the state that, uh, is mostly pushing for that, that even they've admitted that, um, one, the train running will actually induce demand. So induced demand does work for other forms of transportation. And there are, are, I can't remember how much of its ridership. I think it was only like 10% of it would actually be induced demand instead of just uh, displaced demand from other, you know, modes of transportation, usually cars or people coming for tourist reasons or just otherwise because they would have taken the Empire Builder and they might switch just for the new scenery. But the fact is that, yeah, you can induce demand, which means induced economic activity wherever they get off. So that's what you would mostly be selling, which is also an issue that with traffic that um, kind of like personal story with me since I live in the Bay Area and do go to Reno periodically, well, once a year because um, I used to live there. I would actually go more often if there was a train, well, more than the Zephyr, like if the four buses a day that used to run between the Bay Area, well, Sacramento and Reno, um, with connections to the trains in Sacramento, if those were actually trains, I'd actually probably go like probably three or more times a year instead of just once um, a year. And the reason being is one, I don't really like dealing with the transfer in Sacramento, especially if I'm like hauling luggage and it's... With the station being further away from the train platforms, it's actually kind of an inconvenience now considering there isn't checked bags on the Capitol Corridor. And the traffic is actually so intolerable between Fairfield and Roseville that I actually do not like driving it. And I think that is also one of the other things. If you can convince politicians that, hey, by the way, um, this will be good for economic activity because magnet that and that you'll induce demand for the rail services and the services near the stations. That alone can convince people. And honestly, it, the issue with induced demand in automobile drivers is the only really way to displace that is to reduce capacity of highways. And that's not something that we can do at this moment. Like I think if in 15 years, if we got the Amtrak 2035 plan that I did, I think we actually could be at a point where we actually could have the conversation of like getting rid of some highway capacity or turning them into dedicate some of the highway lanes into dedicated bus lanes to basically give bus companies kind of a leg up and make it make buses into also a useful form of, tra of travel that at that point we actually would start seeing people shift to trains because basically the only way to deal with induced demand is just to reduce capacity so um, before I like totally spoil a future video, I am going to just leave it there. And, uh, I think it's actually going to be, yeah, it's going to be like a normal length video. So I just want to thank you guys for the questions, the answers, the viewing, the being, um, subscribed, the commenting, um, just overall the support for the channel. And, you know, if you know people who want to, you know, learn about the stuff, Hey, don't, you know, share if you want to. And also I have a discord and hopefully I remember to link it, which, um, will be down below if I do. 
Um, really bad at promoting that. It's still new. And I think there's only like four of us at the time of me recording this, but you know, it's there if you guys want to contact me, because it's like literally the only play way you're going to get a hold of me besides YouTube. <laughs> just saying, because I don't want a Twitter, because Twitter is a hellhole. But anyways, just thank you for the support. Thank you for the watching. Thank you for the subscribing. Thank you for, well, just everything and 500 and however many subscribers I have at the time I'm recording this. Actually, I can just pop over here and look. 565 at the time of recording this. Thank you all for the views and the watching and the subscribing. And I, again, I just thank you. Like, I don't know what else to say besides thank you. And um, I'm just going to leave it there. And I'll see you in the next video.